So it's my privilege now to introduce Dr. George Matthew. Uh, George Matthew, amazingly, is, is 70 years old, although he looks a, a lot younger than that. He initially graduated from Christian Medical College in Valor in 1975, and then worked in a leprosy hospital in the Kingdom of Bhutan, very isolated spot. And then after that, he worked in a rural unit of CMC Valor back in India. And then three years later, he joined back as the faculty in the Department of Surgery, uh, did some postgraduate study in Australia in upper GI and laparoscopic surgery, received a doctorate in medicine from the University of Adelaide, and then came back to Valor after that. He served in a whole variety of capacities in Valor as vice principal of postgraduate education, as council secretary, as associate director for missions, and frequently volunteered to help Christian hospitals by relieving young doctors and helping them in laparoscopic surgery. And his initial experience of working in a very remote area created an abiding passion to help the younger surgeons working in isolation. So after retiring from CMC as professor of surgery and dean of the medical school, he uh, spent seven years developing a young medical college and teaching hospital at a Christian university in Indonesia before coming back to India, where he's currently working in a remote hospital in Shanti Bhavan Medical Center in the Biru village in a very isolated tribal region of Jharkhand in Northeast India. So it's our real privilege today to have you, Dr. Matthew, and uh, I'll hand over to you now for your presentation on facing COVID in a remote and resource poor situation. Thank you. Okay, uh, good evening everybody. Uh, I at the outset want to thank Dr. Peter Saunders, Dr. Santosh Matthew and Josh Mills for organizing this uh, meeting. I have the privilege of sharing with you the challenges of facing COVID in a remote and resource poor location in India this evening. The area that I'm talking to you about would be very unfamiliar to you. It's uh, full of dense forest and misty valleys. Tucked away in these dense forests are small hamlets which are populated by a colorful tribal people with a delightful sense of rhythm, music and dance. This is in a state called Jharkhand, and I am specifically referring to a district called Simdega, where I am situated. The health parameters of the district are so poor, it is almost the same as sub-Saharan Africa. This is populated by uh, people, 26% of them are tribals, what we call as indigenous people, and about 1.5 million among them are Christians. Wherever you go, you mostly see women in the older age group because the young men and the fit have gone away to other parts of India seeking employment and increased income. Somewhere in this land, in the middle of nowhere, is a hospital which stands as the outpost of Christian compassion and care for a large region around inhabited by little hamlets dotted into the forest land. This beautiful part of India is marred by a very violent history of bloodshed and violence brought about by land rights and Mao's movements. I joined this hospital almost three years ago, struck by its immense isolation and the stark poverty around. These are the hamlets which look untouched by modernity or development. The education is rudimentary. Most of the schools have hardly any students and those students look stare at a very bleak future because their elders are caught up in a vice of alcohol and violence. Alcohol is made from the flowers of these trees, which is called the Mahua. 
This hospital has been in existence for the past six years, serving the disadvantaged and the poor population of this region. It has a reliable laboratory which can do basic investigations, no sophisticated investigations like interleukin levels or ferritin levels. It has a reasonably stocked pharmacy. And the common conditions we see are what you have not seen in other parts of the world. This is a maggot infested chronic ulcer which has been neglected. And another crawling thing which is vicious and poisonous, this is the crate. Many people are bitten by this snake and are brought to the hospital. By God's grace and the help of these young people, we have managed to save almost 100% of these snake bites. Alcohol intoxication and suicide is common. Mostly it is by using pesticides which they use for agriculture. We have, managed, we have to deal with them quite often and manage to save most of these cases. This is trauma, which is very common. This is a lady who has been gored by a bull, totally eviscerated. We managed to patch her up, heal her, and send her back home. Because of the sparse healthcare infrastructure, I often have to go to the villages to conduct clinics. I usually use the local tea shop as my clinic and have a cup of tea also during that time. The first case of COVID was reported in India from the west coast of India in Kerala, which was on the 30th of January. And for us in Jharkhand, it seemed a world away. We were traveling on the pace because we were confident that the virus will not travel to us so remote and so isolated. Then came the national lockdown because of the increasing cases where the whole country was shut down and it was for a 21 day first and then it was extended for many months. And in our district of Simdega, people could not even go out of their houses. The first case came to our state on 31st of March, it was a young woman who traveled from Malaysia via Delhi and brought the virus to this state. Even then, we were sure it would not reach Jharkhand, reach Biru, the village where we were, but we were absolutely wrong. The government panicked and they sent us a order stating that we would be the COVID hospital for the whole district. This was totally un unexpected. And my first reaction was this sinking feeling in my stomach, fear. Fear of what is going to happen, fear of what I should do. And soon I found that the stigma associated with this virus was enormous in the community. There was also a lack of information and communication. I was cut off from the mainstream medical community and so I had to scramble around finding information and studying more about this infection. And my own lack of experience, I am a surgeon with no specialized internal medicine training and I was not sure of the roadmap forwards. The biggest challenges were manpower, then material, and last but not least, the money. I was the senior most doctor, or 70 years old. There was an anesthetist who was an occasional, uh, would do a occasional stint. I had two junior doctors to rely upon who had just finished their undergraduate education, very committed, very sincere. We had 15 nurses and already three of them had taken leave for their maternity. And we had various levels of training among the nurses. Some of them advise, many of them locally trained with no formal education, and some were doing housekeeping work and were minimally literate or illiterate. There were no PPEs available, even in the capital 
of our state. There were no medicines specific for this virus. The only medicine I had was chloroquine, which I used for malaria. There were no N95 masks available. Oxygen on a normal day took 48 hours to get a refill, and now it is going to take many days. There were no hand sanitizers. We procured industrial spirit for using as sanitizers. And with the lockdown, the logistics became even more complicated. We finally acquired some drugs, which we thought would be useful for the COVID-19 infection. We had no antivirals, no source resources to buy remdesivir or any such modern high-tech medicines. We started by making our own PPEs. We gathered and scrounged around for material, plastic, cloth, whatever we could get, and we made our own PPEs because we knew the first case would be with us soon. Next we found was that the stigma of this disease was unprecedented. Our staff were stigmatized and ostracized because everyone knew we were the COVID hospital and people were prevented from coming to our hospital or going back to their villages. So the only solution was to take them into the hospital, give them accommodation and give them food. This was an enormous financial burden. So we catered for the patients as well as for all the staff. We started a facility of 50 beds for the COVID and we made whatever provision we could. We had no negative pressure rooms. We converted them to negative pressure with exhaust fans. But in spite of all this, there was immense amount of fear among the staff, including myself. Everybody's mind was with questions of what will happen to us? Will we become sick? Will, what will happen to our family? If we become sick, who will take care of us? For me, it was a fear of the safety of patients and the fear of my own inadequacy in facing the complications of COVID. Somebody said, courage is not the absence of fear, but courage is to stand up and face the danger even when you are shivering in your shoes. But for us as Christians, we had an assurance from our Lord and Savior, where we have been given in the Bible, fear not, I am with you. This we repeated day in and day out, assuring each of us not to have fear. We started with prayer. We gathered every morning and evening to pray, to share, to share our fears, as well as to share our thoughts. I had to create a team. I create a team out of a mottled bunch of people with various levels of education, competencies, and understanding. So I had to talk to them at their level and begin to build a team which is cohesive. Starting with the security, this is one of my young colleagues who was very hardworking and sincere and was with me all the time. We had to make our own protocols and procedures. This is the PPE we made. You can look and see how cumbersome it is. And it was really uncomfortable wearing it, especially if you're wearing it for two or three hours, you're soaked in sweat. And in our weather, with no air conditioning, it is exhausting. We did not have any infrared thermometers, so we used the normal thermometers and kept our distance with implements like this. We knew that it was a droplet infection, so and but we were not sure how our masks were efficient. So we made an extra layer of protection by making the patient wear a head cover with plastic so that we would be prevented from droplet infection. While we innovated barriers, we made protocols which would make us uh, more protective and keep our distance from patients. And I had to go through the protocols morning, afternoon, evening, so that everybody understood. For them, 
scientific knowledge about the virus was not possible so they had to know a routine they had to know a protocol step 1 step 2 step 3 they could follow a protocol including wearing of ppes doffing and donning initially there were very little information that i could get it was come trickling in from china from italy from uk but there was also a flood of misinformation in the social and news media in our country it was full of doom and gloom and it added to the existing dilemma and for me it was difficult to keep up with the information overload especially appearing in the electronic media media to shift between what is relevant what is not relevant so i spent the whole nights going through all these information and in our own country the agencies that put out guidelines were changing constantly and there didn't seem to be much consensus each state was putting out its own protocol so although there was a lot of information it was difficult to know the reliable and what is pragmatic and information on covid 2 was evolving rapidly in this situation there was an added problem there was a migrant influx many of the people who had gone out of the state started pouring back into the state because of the lockdown ignoring all rules of lockdown and staying with mask and distancing and this became a major crisis people who were herded into vehicles which were available like cattle herded from various states and were dropped off at the border of the state where i am and they were housed in camps like this which were overcrowded understaffed and ill equipped and the only thing that they were asked is whether they were had fever if they had fever they were suspected to have covid and they were sent to the hospital most of the patients who came were dehydrated exhausted and with a lot of tender loving care good hydration nutrition they bounced back but the others tested positive and we admitted them they would all wear this head covering when we were close to them even children complied and i found that the saturation does not increase if they wear it only for less than an hour we had no facility for non invasive in ventilation so the only oxygen we could give was by mask or nasal catheter and we knew from information that there is significant aerosolization from this and so we had to make protective devices we had to devise our own we made devices like this which could guard us from aerosolization when we gave high volume oxygen to the patients this could be done even in the prone position intubation was a procedure i knew was fraught with danger we devised a shield a cabinet like this this is cannibalized from a baby incubator so that it would protect me and the nurses during this time there was changing of testing criteria quarantine criteria admission criteria discharge criteria follow up criteria every now and then these criteria kept changing as things evolved this added only to the anxiety and the fear and our reassurance was from our god as we read from isaiah which said fear not i am with you be not dismayed for i am your god i will strengthen you i will help you i will uphold you with my righteous hand we had to reassure each other that this was a fact and this was an unchangeable promise lastly we did not have any money we lost all source of income because we could not treat non covid patients we could not admit any patients no emergencies we could look after and we could not do any procedures or surgeries soon we found that we did not have money even to feed our staff or the patients 
and I being responsible for the rest of the staff, the only thing I could do was to fall on my knees and pray to God for his grace and his mercy. Soon, trickles of blessings started to flow. My friends, my colleagues, my classmates, my teachers, many of my co-workers, people who worked with me before started to send help and prayed hard for us to sustain. And soon we were able to live from day to day. We treated 173 patients and including six pregnant and two children. And all of them were treated and they became negative and gone home without any loss of life. We struggled for more months and then slowly the government doctors around us agreed to initially help us when they knew that it wasn't so dangerous. But initially to set up a quarantine center, then they sent up, set up a holding center for asymptomatic cases. They knew that it's, and now asymptomatic mild cases are looked after by a facility set up by them while we have agreed to take care of all intensive care and intubated patients. We had to do a lot of hand holding before they would start. So far, there have been 1,073 cases, cases positive. Out of them, 820 have recovered. And the situation and the crisis and the battle continues. The lessons I learned from this crisis was that very often you have no choice but to lead from the front. Sometimes you just have to be the captain. You can't wait for someone else to lead and everyone is looking for somebody else to follow. And it is important to be willing to be a servant leader. And the other thing I learned is that you have to adapt, innovate, improvise because everything was less than ideal. There was nothing that was ideal in my situation and you had to be with what you had. I had to institute a routine order on my staff because everyone did not have the same level of education or understanding, but they understood the routine. So if they, if I insist on a routine, they would follow it. And I could not or demand. Everyone did not have the same perfection. Everybody was bound to make this. But they understood, including me. And I stuck with the familiar achievement. Now I had become a government servant, a government daughter, so I had to be a woman. Now I had to obey the government authorities for what instructions and guidelines they put out. I had to assure every member of our staff that I, and I stuck with the familiar and the doctor, so I had to be a woman. Now, and and that there is happy caring and listening. Empathy was a priority, and I had to be sensitive to the digital backgrounds and capabilities of all our members of the team, trusting even in the, the smallest of the members of the team. I had to give the message that I trusted them fully because a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. I had to keep encouraging everyone throughout that we can do it. We had to move fast and come together very often. I was deliberately calm and always conveyed only bounded optimism in words. Like they say, courage they are the only one who knows you are scared to death. I hid my fear from them. We survived. All this adversity by grace, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the grace of a lot of the people who supported us with materials, money, and prayer. And we survived because of the immense grit of the small team that we had. In spite of tiring routines, exhaustion, and sweat and tears, everybody stuck together. We worked hard in, in spite of being tired and exhausted. And lastly, 
an immense sense of gratitude to God and gratitude to each other for being there for each other, for helping each other in spite of our adversity. We are living in unprecedented times. And from the Fellowship of the Ring, I wish to quote, Fodo said, I wish it need not have happened in my time. So do I, said Gandalf. And so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. But we know that our time is not in our hands. Our times are in our God's hands. And we trust in our Lord. As the psalmist says, but I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Very often, it is exhausting, tiring, frustrating, sometimes to the point of giving up. What we knew, we were held in the hands of a loving God who would continue to uphold us and strengthen us. He is a God who promised, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by my name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Dear friends, this has been the real experience of this small team in a remote and isolated part of India. And I thank you all for listening to me. Thank you so much that we've been listening to Dr. George Matthew <clears throat> talking about facing COVID in a remote and resource poor location up in the northeast of India. And uh, what an extraordinary story, an amazing testimony of hard work and courage and of God's incredible provision for you at that time. So uh, we move into a time of questions now. And... Uh, Dr. Matthew, I'm really quite overwhelmed with what you've been sharing and the, the your personal testimony and uh, your powerful faith in the Lord through it all and the way you managed to get yourself organized with virtually nothing. It's uh, so many lessons that can be learned by people all over the world. And we've got questions coming in now. Um, I've... <clears throat> Uh, first of all, from uh, from Indonesia, question. Thank you for this amazing testimony. Greetings to you from CMDF Indonesia family. Uh, they, they know you, of course, from your work with the medical school. And the question is, are there any healthcare workers in your institution infected with COVID-19? And what's your opinion with many countries struggling with so many healthcare workers infected with COVID-19? Well, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, by God's immense grace, not a single staff has so far had COVID-19 infection. Now, I don't owe it to any particular thing we did. One of the thing, one of the uh, initial uh, things I did was I put all of our staff on prophylactic hydroxychloroquine. I am not sure if that is the cause. We were very strict with our protocols. We were, I was like an army sergeant going around making sure everybody followed the protocols. Uh, but everyone cooperated and so by God's grace all of us have been without COVID infection thus far. Now it is almost six months. Dr. Matthew, Hello. What, yes. what are your thoughts about uh, other countries that and institutions that have struggled with so many healthcare workers infected with COVID-19? I know it's been a huge problem here in the UK, yes. although we're over the, yes. the worst of it now. But uh, what do you think others did wrong or what lessons can we learn from your experience? I, I, I only want to say that when you have all the facilities, 
maybe you just take it a little more lightly in the sense that uh, you think this is another uh, viral infection like a cold. For us, we we were full of fear. So we, we followed every precaution that is possible and all of us took prophylactic hydroxychloroquine. Uh, I don't know how effective it is. There is no, I'm not, I'm not going into that controversy, but maybe it did help, maybe it did not. But maybe also, maybe I don't know if the, the strain of virus that we had is less virulent. So all of those are scientific uh, questions I cannot answer. But what I can say is that because we were so anxious and so fearful of this infection, I think we were unduly careful. And so we were very meticulous in our protocols of sanitization, PPEs, although it was exhausting and tiring. Maybe that is what that helped us. I think we didn't let our guard down. Thank you. A question here about PPE asking, did you have uh, the ability for 3D printing to make PPE? Or was that, is that just something that's <laughs> laughable in your context? I have not even seen a 3D printer. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I think it's, it's something I have, I have read about, but I don't, uh, it, it's not available anywhere there in uh, nearby in India, maybe in the cities. I think it's not a realistic solution for us. Okay. A question the only that you mentioned. printer we had were our hands. <laughs> <laughs> now, you mentioned earlier on that there were one and a half million Christians living in the area where, where you live. Yes. And yes. someone's asked a question yes. here, given that the Christian population in India is only about 2%, what do you yes. attribute the large variety of Christian medical and dental colleges that you have there in your part of the country? I guess it's largely historical, is it? Yes, it's uh, largely historical. Um, there are only a handful of Christian medical colleges left now in the country, uh, two or three in the south and one in the north. Uh, there are no other professed Christian medical colleges uh, who are practicing their faith. I mean, they, in name, they may be Christian, but uh, they've all become corporate. Okay. Another question saying, appreciated your emphatic work. What would be the best treatment for people living with the virus without out outside the reach of a doctor. So in the community, uh, what's the best treatment that people can have? I think the, the best, I mean, if for a healthy person with no comorbidities, as long as they uh, hydrate themselves well, they have good nutrition and they avoid infecting other people and they follow certain normal precautions of, you know, not going out and uh, being exposed to the weather. And I think most often it is a self-limiting infection, but they should know the early signs of danger so that they can start coming to the doctor or the healthcare post immediately, which is you know, breathing difficulty or fever, which is unremitting or gastrointestinal problems, which are continuing with diarrhea or vomiting. And so all in the remote area, it is important to give out health information so that people can know what is the danger signs and they can seek help early. And the rest of the time they can <coughs> keep themselves well hydrated, good nutrition, and isolated. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here. When I tuned into 
the EMFI webinar, I noticed that there are lots of practitioners out of work. Is there an opportunity for these doctors to take on missionary work that's funded by the global north, what we like to call the West? Yes, I mean, if people are willing to work, I think it will be a tremendous boost to mission outposts like ours, which is struggling with manpower problems. We have such shortage of manpower. But are they able to go to such remote areas is the question. Is it desirable is another question. And the, in the current environment of COVID, do these elderly people want to expose themselves to the dangers of COVID? I would say that they need to think hard. But if everything was normal, we go back to how things were before, I think it is a solution that we can think of at least as, as stopgap. When somebody wants to go on a desperate need of uh, leave, they want some time off to study. They want some time off to look after their family. Somebody can replace them. It doesn't mean that the hospital needs to be left without a doctor or help. So if there is a mechanism by which it can be coordinated and channeled, I think it will be a tremendous help. But it needs a lot of coordination and you know planning. Thank you. Uh, another question here. We are a mission hospital in Odisha. We have a fairly good supply of PPE, but are still apprehensive about intubation. I wanted to know if you think intubating with PPE is safe, or would you prefer using an incubator cage like you made in your hospital in addition to the PPE? It's a very practical question there. I personally feel that you should use uh, incubating tent or cage like what I showed you in spite of your PPE because uh, very often your mask slips, your visor is not in place and you know that there is tremendous amount of aerosolization due during a difficult intubation. These are not planned intubations so uh, you're going to have a lot of secretion, you're going to have a lot of aerosolization uh, and unless your staff who are helping you are very skilled, you are liable to have aerosolization on yourself or on your face or on your mask. So if it is possible, you could get something like that. But if it's not available, I would say at least wear a face shield on top of your uh, you know, protective mask and have adequate suction so that there is least bit of aerosolization. Having said that, more and more evidence is there now to try and manage with non-invasive ventilation. Many patients whom we thought would need intubation, I think can be managed with non-invasive methods of ventilation if you start them on steroids early. Uh, that may not be your experience, but I think the world all over is going more towards non-invasive ventilation uh, as a priority. And in a small place, that is something you could try before you intubate. Someone's saying here, thank you for your presentation. You always look very healthy. It's, it's same from Indonesia. Uh, what can we do to help the patients in your hospital? having listened to this presentation and being moved by it? Um, first and foremost, continue to pray for us. Uh, being in a distant place, it is uh, very unrealistic to expect you to come here and help us. Uh, you could help us with gifts uh, of uh, material, or money, but that is also a logistical problem. So I think the most important is pray for us. And prayer can achieve everything. We depend 
on your prayers and for us your prayer support is more important than anything else thank you now uh, did you have any covid positive deliveries during this time and if so how did you manage them no we did not have any covid positive deliveries i was praying on my knees that we shouldn't have we had six pregnant women none of them went into labor some of them were in their last trimester i am not an obstetrician we don't have an obstetrician i don't do regular obstetrics so i was really anxious about if they went into labor but by god's grace none of them went into labor they've all gone home most probably they will go to the local obstetrician thank you uh, a question now from west africa thank you for your confidence and courage for the experience uh, of the mission hospital how many people in the medical team got sick while caring for patients i think you've already asked uh, answered that already and how would you deal with it but perhaps uh, had someone got sick how would you have dealt with it yeah so if anyone there it's not that nobody got sick somebody people had colds and coughs and things like that feeling lethargic so i would always give them time off ask them to we had a system of one week on one week off for the nurses although we were a small team and if they were feeling unwell i would tell them to leave immediately check their temperatures check their saturation they all stayed within the hospital so we could monitor them keep them on isolation at least for 7 days if they were fever free their saturation was all right they were feeling better they were allowed to come back otherwise i would test them for covid for by god's grace not a single person has so far tested positive for covid uh, with regard to ppe did you i know you made your own masks and equipment were you able to involve the local community in that or was it mainly the hospital staff who were who were doing that work uh we uh the hospital staff were doing it our own nurses and uh, uh housekeeping staff and security and we all joined together as a community effort we got the local tailor to come and stitch for us we got some of the women from the community who were good at sewing to come and help us but we got the material cut it uh got it stitched so it was a it is partly a community effort but mostly our own staff and we distributed the mask to the community and everybody who came to the hospital thank you there's a question here about vaccines we hear lots about the covid vaccine in the media is there any vaccine at all so far what's <laughs> an indian perspective on that <laughs> uh from from where i am i am i am sitting and i am living vaccine seems to be so far away and even if there is a vaccine tomorrow by the time it reaches my village in the back of beyond it is going to take minimum 2 years 3 years and the people around me will not be able to afford if it is not you know low cost unless the government is willing to subsidize it and when this will happen is a million dollar question so for me vaccine is not a solution which is going to be in the short term maybe 3 5 years down the line that may be a solution but for now it has to be uh, the accepted methods of mask wearing mask social distancing hand sanitization and keeping ourselves isolated that is the only viable strategy now what sort of diagnostic facilities did you have did you have the pcr test available we have the pcr test available it is available initially in the state capital which was 130 kilometers away 
it took, takes about four hours by road so we had to send the samples there it would take one day to reach there and it takes about four to five days before we get the results back so by then anyway i start treating the patients empirically and many of them were treated as covid till the results came uh, now we have in the government hospital uh, whatever you called it a mini pcr uh, it's called true net which we can get in 24 hours but we get the result the next day so it has become much easier in two days we can get the report and soon hopefully with the government's help i will get the antigen kits which is uh, uh, more rapid rapid antigen kits and so things may change uh, for the better uh, in the near future what's the situation there now dr matthew are you seeing a reduction in cases do you think you're over the peak or is it still quite relentless it is still quite relentless every day there is about in the state about 1200 cases in our district there is about 30 to 60 new cases every day this is only those who have been tested we do not know how many are there for so that's a big question uh, we don't have community wide testing we test only those who are symptomatic and who come to the hospital for testing. Someone's asking here, uh, Vinod Shah, who you will know well, he was my predecessor at ICMDA. Yes. And now in the law. He's yes, a great yes. champion on home care uh, in Indian villages. What, what is the place for home care in this pandemic? And what, uh, what kind of experience have you had there in your situation? Uh, one of the problems that in my area is that they are all marginalized. Most of them have single parts. Now, now, if I say most of them have single room or two rooms, somebody has to be on home isolation, it is a very unrealistic way. Do all the others more only he be in the house. So we need to tailor the strategy to people in that area. In the south, I know that people have houses have housing. So possibility. But in the area that I am now, most of say somebody has it is all the very unrealistic mother in the house. So more single room or two that so now Six to eight is a possibility, but in the area where I should space for them to isolate, uh, maybe a common facility. So that's what we are doing now. The government providing holding facilities for isolation of asymptomatic COVID patients. Okay, thank you. We're just losing you a little bit there, but but in fact our time uh, has yeah. now how, has now gone even though there are more questions to, to answer. Um, one, uh, perhaps one final comment here from one listener. We'll be praying for you and your team members and the patients. Keep up the good work you've started. Thank you, thank you, thank Until you very much. Until the coming of our savior, Jesus Christ. And thank you so much. It's been inspirational today. So many practical lessons, but especially the spiritual lessons and your example of stepping up to the plate and being courageous and leading in a situation where there was very little help at all. I, I think many will take away lessons. So we've uh, sadly come to the end of this webinar, uh, listening to Dr. George Matthew on facing COVID in a remote and resource poor location. And it just remains for me to say again, once more, Dr. George Matthew, so, thank you so much for giving us your time your wisdom, your expertise and encouragement and uh, speaking to people all over the world today. Uh, may God bless you and keep you until uh, we meet again. Thank you.